before we jump into Q&A, Elon has some opening remarks. Elon? Uh, thanks, Martin. So to recap, in Q1, we navigated several unforeseen challenges, as well as the ramp for the updated Model 3 in Fremont. Um, we, there was, as, as people have seen, the EV adoption rate uh, globally is under pressure, and, and a lot of uh, other water manufacturers are pulling back on EVs and pursuing plug-in hybrids instead. We believe this is not the right strategy, and electric vehicles will ultimately dominate the market. Despite these challenges, the Tesla team did a great job executing it executing in a tough environment, uh, and uh, energy storage deployments, the mega pack in particular, reached an all-time high in Q1, leading to record profitability for the energy business. And that, that looks likely to continue to increase uh, in the quarters and years ahead. It will increase, we actually know that it will. Um, so uh, significantly faster than the, the car business, uh, as we expected. Uh, we also continue to expand our uh, AI training capacity in Q1, more than doubling our training compute uh, sequentially. In terms of the new product roadmap, there's been a lot of talk about our upcoming vehicle line in the next in the past several weeks. Uh, we've updated our future vehicle lineup to accelerate the launch of new models ahead of previously mentioned startup production in the second half of, of 2025. So we expect it to be more like the early 2025, if not late this year. These new vehicles, including more affordable models, We'll use aspects of the next generation platform as well as aspects of our current platforms and will be able to be produced on the same manufacturing lines as our current vehicle lineup. This is so it's not contingent on any new factory or massive new production line. Uh, it, it'll be made on our current production lines much more efficiently. And, and we think this should allow us to get to over 3 million vehicles of, of capacity uh, when realized to the full extent. Uh, regarding FSD version 12, um, which is the, the pure AI-based self-driving. People, uh, if, you, if you haven't experienced this, I strongly urge you to try it out. It's profound. Um, and the rate of improvement is, is rapid. So we've, and we've, we've now turned that on for all cars with the uh, cameras and inference computer and everything from Hardware 3 on uh, in North America. So it's been pushed out to I think around 1.8 million vehicles. Um, and we're seeing about half of people use it so far, and that that percentage is increasing with each passing week. Um, so we now have over 300 billion miles that have been driven with FSD V12. Um, since the launch of full self-driving, super, supervised full self-driving, it's become very clear that the vision-based approach with end-to-end -end neural networks is the right solution for scalable autonomy. And it's, it's really how humans drive. Uh, the, the, our entire road network is designed for biological neural nets and eyes. So naturally, uh, cameras and digital neural nets are the solution to our current road system. To make it more accessible, we've reduced the subscription price to $99 a month, so it's easy to try out. Uh, as we've announced, we'll be showcasing our purpose-built um, robo-taxi or cyber cab in August. Regarding AI compute, um, over the past few months, we've been actively working on expanding Tesla's core AI infrastructure. Uh, for a while there, we were training constrained in our progress. Uh, we are, at this point, uh, no longer training constrained, and so we're making rapid progress. Uh, we've installed and, and commissioned, meaning they're actually working, uh, 35,000 H100 uh, computers or GPUs. Or GPU is the wrong word. They need a new word. <laughs> I always feel like a wince when I say GPU, because it's not GPU, that's G stands for graphics and doesn't do graphics. Uh, roughly 35,000 H100s are active, and we expect that to be probably 85,000 or thereabouts by the end of this year. And training, just for training. We are making sure that we're being as efficient as possible in our training. It's not just about the number of H100s, but how efficiently they're used. In conclusion, we're super excited about our autonomy roadmap. I think it should be obvious to anyone who's driving uh, version 12 in a Tesla that, uh, that um, it is only a matter of time before we exceed the reliability of humans, and it, not much time at that. And the, 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 we're really headed for an electric vehicle, uh, an autonomous future. I'll go back to something I said several years ago, that in the future, uh, gasoline, uh, Gasoline cars that are not autonomous will be like riding a horse and using a flip phone. 
and that will become very obvious in, in hindsight. We continue to make the necessary investments that will drive growth and profits for Tesla in the future. And I wanted to thank the Tesla team for incredible execution during this period and look forward to everything that we have planned ahead. Thank you very much. And uh, Vibhav has some comments as well. You know, it's important to acknowledge what Elon said uh, from our auto business perspective. Uh, we did see a season uh, decline in revenues quarter over quarter, and those were primarily because of seasonality, uncertain macroeconomic environment, and the, main, and the other reasons which Elon had mentioned earlier. Auto margins declined from 189 to 18.5%. Excluding the impact of Cybertruck, the impact of pricing actions was largely offset by reductions in per unit cost and the, and the recognition of revenue from auto park feature for certain vehicles in US that previously did not have that functionality. Additionally, while we did experience higher costs due to the ramp of Model 3 in Fremont and disruptions in Berlin, these costs were largely offset by cost reduction initiatives. In fact, if we exclude Cybertruck and Fremont, and Fremont Model 3 RAM costs, the revenue from Auto Park auto margins improved slightly. Currently, normalized Model Y cost per vehicle in Austin and Berlin are already very close to that of Fremont. Our ability to reduce costs without sacrificing on quality was due to the amazing efforts of the team in executing Tesla's relentless pursuit of efficiency across the business. We've also witnessed that as other OEMs are pulling back on their investments in EV, there is increasing appetite for credits, and that means a steady stream of revenue for us. Obviously, seeing others pull back from EV is not the future we want. We would prefer it the whole industry went all in. On the demand front, we have undertaken a variety of initiatives, including low lowering the price of both the purchase and subscription options for FSD, launching extremely attractive leasing specials for the Model 3 in the US for $2.99 a month, and offering attracting financing options in certain markets. We believe that our awareness activities paired with attractive financing will go a long way in expanding our reach and driving demand for our products. Our energy business continues to make meaningful progress with margins reaching a record of 24.6%. We expect the energy storage deployments for 2024 to grow at least 75% higher from 2023. And accordingly, this business will begin contributing significantly to our overall profitability. Note that there is a bit of lumpiness in our storage deployments due to a variety of factors that are outside of our control, so deployments may fluctuate quarter over quarter. On the operating expense front, we saw a sequential increase from our AI initiatives, uh, continued investment in future projects, marketing, and other activities. We had negative free cash flow of 2.5 billion in the first quarter. The primary driver of this was an increase in inventory from a mismatch between bills and deliveries, as discussed before, and our elevated spend on CapEx across various initiatives, including AI compute. We expect the inventory bill to reverse in the second quarter and free cash flow to return to positive again. As we prepare the company for the next phase of growth, we have to make the hard but necessary decision to reduce our headcount by over 10%. The savings generated are expected to be well in excess of 1.1 excess of 1 billion on an annual run rate basis. We are also getting hyper-focused on CapEx efficiency and utilizing our installed capacity in a more efficient manner. The savings from these initiatives, including our cost reductions, will help improve our overall profitability and ultimately enable us to increase the scale of our investments in AI. In conclusion, the future is extremely bright and the journey to get there while challenging will be extremely rewarding. Once again, I would like to thank the whole Tesla team for delivering great results. And we can open it up to Q&A. Thank you. Okay, let's start with investor Q&A. Uh, the first question is, what is the status of 4680? Uh, what is the current output? Lars? Sure. Um, <clears throat> 4680 production increased about 18-20% uh, over from Q4 reaching greater than 1K a week for Cybertruck, which is about 7 gigawatt hours per year as we posted on X. We expect to stay ahead of the Cybertruck ramp with the cell production um, throughout Q2 as we ramp the third of four lines in phase one. 
um, while maintaining multiple weeks of sell inventory to make sure we're ahead of the ramp. Um, because we're ramping, COGS continues to drop rapidly week over week, driven by yield improvements throughout the lines and production volume increases. So um, our goal, and we expect to do this, is to beat supplier cost of nickel-based sales by the end of the year. Thank you. Uh, the, the second question is on Optimus. Uh, so what is the current status of Optimus? Are they currently performing any factory tasks? When do you expect to start mass production? Uh, we are able to do simple factory tasks, or at least I should say factory tasks in the lab. In terms of actually, we, we do we do think we will have Optimus um, in limited production in the factory, in the actual factory itself, doing useful tasks before the end of this year. I think we, we may be able to sell it externally by the end of next year. Uh, these are just, just guesses. Um, as I've said before, I think Optimus will be more valuable than everything else combined. Uh, because if you've, if you've got a, a sentient humanoid robot, uh, that is able to navigate reality and do tasks at, at request. Um, there is no meaningful limit to the size of the economy. That's that's what's going to happen. Um, and I think Tesla is best positioned of any humanoid robot maker to be able to reach volume production um, with efficient inference on the robot itself. The, I mean, this perhaps is a point that is worth emphasizing. Tesla's inference, AI inference efficiency is vastly better than anyone, any other company. No, there's no company even close to the inference efficiency of Tesla. We've, we've had to do that because we were constrained by the inference hardware in the car. We'd never choice. But that, that will pay dividends in many ways. Thank you. Uh, the third question is, uh... What is Tesla's current uh, assessment of the pathway towards regulatory approval for unsupervised FSD in the US? And how should we think about the appropriate safety threshold compared to human drivers? Sure, I can start. Um, there are a handful of states that already have adopted autonomous vehicle laws. Um, these states are paving the way for operations while the, we, the data for such operations guides a broader adoption of driverless vehicles. I think Ashok can talk a little bit about our safety methodology, but we expect that these states and the work ongoing, as well as the data that we're providing, will uh, pave a way for a broad-based regulatory approval um, in, in, in the U.S. at least, and then other countries as well. Yeah. Um, it's actually been pretty helpful that other autonomous car companies um, have been cutting a path through the regulatory jungle. Um, but the, which is, so that's, that's actually quite helpful. Um, and they, they have obviously been operating in San Francisco for a while. I think they got approval for City of LA. Um, so these, these approvals are happening rapidly. I, I think if you've got at scale it's a statistically significant amount of data that shows conclusively that the autonomous car has, let's say, uh, half the accident rate of a human-driven car, I think that's difficult to ignore because at that point, Stopping autonomy means killing people. I, I actually do not think that there will be significant regulatory barriers, provided there is conclusive data that the autonomous car is safer than a human-driven car. And in, in my view, this will be much like elevators. Mm -hmm. like, elevators used to be operated by a guy with a relay switch, um, but sometimes that guy would get tired or drunk or uh, just make a mistake and share somebody in half between floors. So now we just have we just get in an elevator and press a button. We don't think about it. Um, in fact, it's kind of weird if somebody's standing there with a relay switch. That'll be how cars work. You just summon a car using your phone. You get in. It takes you to your destination. You get out. You don't even think about it. You don't even think about it. Um, just like an elevator. It takes you to, to your floor. That's it. Don't think about how the elevator is working or anything like that. Something I should clarifies that Tesla will be operating the fleet. Um, so you can think of like how Tesla, um, think of Tesla like I don't know, some combination of Airbnb and Uber, meaning that, um, you know, there'll be some number of cars that Tesla owns itself and operates in the fleet. There'll be some number of cars, and then there'll be a bunch of cars where they're owned by the um, end user, but that 
end user can add or subtract their car to the fleet whenever they want. And they can decide if they want to only let the car be used by friends and family or only by five star users or by anyone. Um, and at any, at any time they could have the car come back to them and, and be exclusively theirs, like an Airbnb. You know, you could rent out your guest room or not anytime you want. Um, so uh, as our fleet grows, we have 7 million cars gonna, 9 million cars gonna, you know, eventually tens of millions of cars quiet with a constant feedback loop every time something goes wrong. That, that gets added to the training data and you get this training flywheel happening um, in the same way that Google search has the sort of flywheel. It's very difficult to compete with Google because uh, people are constantly doing searches and clicking and, and Google's getting that feedback loop. Um, it's the same with, with Tesla, but at, at a scale that is um, maybe difficult to comprehend, but ultimately be tens of millions. Um, I think there's also some potential here for an AWS element down the road where if we've got very powerful inference, um, you know, because we've got a hardware three in the cars, not, not, but now all cars are being made with hardware four. Hardware five is pretty much designed and should be in cars, uh, hopefully towards the end of next year. I think there's, there's a potential to have for the, to, to run when the car is not moving to, to actually run distributed inference, kind of like AWS, but, but distributed inference. Like it takes a lot of computers to train um, an AI model, but many orders of magnitude less compute to run it. So if, if you can imagine the future paths where there's a fleet of 100 million Teslas, and on average, they've got like maybe a kilowatt of inference compute that's 100 gigawatts of inference compute distributed all around the world. It's pretty hard to put together 100 gigawatts of AI compute. And even in an autonomous uh, future where the, the car is perhaps used, instead of being used 10 hours a week, is used 50 hours a week, that still leaves over 100 hours a week where the car inference computer could be doing something else. And it seems like it would be a waste not to use it. Actually, do you want to chime in on the air process and safety? Yeah, we are like multiple tiers of um, validating the safety. <clears throat> for like every in any given week, we train hundreds of neural networks that um, can produce you know different trajectories for how to drive the car. We replay them through the millions of clips that we have already collected from our users and our own QA. Those are like critical events, you know, like someone jumping out in front or like other critical events that we have gathered a database over many many years, and we replay through all of them to make sure that we are net improving safety. And on top of it, we have simulation systems that also try to recreate this and test this in closed loop fashion. Once all of this is um, validated, we give it to our own QA drivers. We have hundreds of them in different cities in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Austin, New York, a lot of different locations. They are also driving this and collecting real world miles. And we have an estimate of what are the critical events, are they a net improvement compared to the previous week's bills? And once we have confidence that the, the build is a net, net improvement, then we start shipping to uh, early users, like 2,000 employees initially, that they would like get the build. They would give feedback on like if it's an improvement or are they noticing some new issues that we did not capture in our own QA process. And only after all of this is validated, then we go to external customers. And even when we go external, we have like live dashboards of monitoring every critical event that's happening in the fleet, sorted by you know the criticality of it. Um, so we, we are having a constant pulse on the builds quality and the safety improvement along the way. And then any uh, failures like Elon alluded to, you get the data back, add it to the training, and that improves the model in the next cycle. So we have this like constant feedback loop of issues, fixes, evaluations, uh, and then it rinse and repeat. And especially with the new virtual architecture, all of this is automatically improving without uh, requiring much engineering interventions in the sense that um, people, engineers don't have to be creative in like how they code the algorithms. It's mostly learning on its own based on data. Um, so you see that, okay, we fail here, or like this is how a person shows, this is how you drive this intersection or something like that. We get the data back, we add it to the neural network and it learns from that training data automatically uh, instead of some engineers saying that, oh, 
here you must rotate the steering wheel by this much or something like that. There's no uh, hard inference conditions. It's everything is uh, neural network. It's very soft. It's probabilistic. Um, so it will adapt its probability, probability distribution based on the new data that it's getting. Yeah, and, and um, we, we do have some insight into how good the th things will be in like, let's say three or four months, because we have advanced models that are, are far more capable than what is in the car, um, but have uh, have some issues with them that we need to to fix. So they're like, there'll be, um, it'll be a step change improvement in the capabilities of the car, but it'll have some quirks that are, um, that need to be addressed uh, in order to release it. Um, as Ashok was saying, uh, we have to be very careful in what we release to the fleet um, or to, to customers in general. So like, if we look at say 12.4 and 12.5, which are really could arguably even be version 13, version 14, um, because it's pretty close to a total retrain of the neural nets in, in each case, or substantially different. So we have good insight into where the where, where the models, where, where how the car, how well the car will perform um, in say three or four months. Yeah, in terms of scaling loss, people in the AI community generally talk about model scaling loss, where they increase the model size um, a lot, and then they have corresponding gains in performance. But we have also figured out scaling loss and other access. In addition to the model size scaling, we can also have data scaling. You can increase the amount of data you use to train the neural network, and that also gives uh, similar uh, gains. Uh, and you can also scale up by training compute. You can train it for much longer and get or like more, more GPUs or more Dojo nodes, and that also gives um, better performance. And you can also have architecture scaling where you count with better architectures that uh, for the same amount of compute produce better results. So a combination of model size scaling, data scaling, training compute scaling, and the architecture scaling, we, we can basically extra, like, okay, if we continue scaling based on these at uh, this ratio, we can sort of like predict future performance. Obviously, it takes time to do the ex experiments because it takes, you know, few weeks to train. It takes few weeks to collect tens of millions of video clips and process all of them. Uh, but you can estimate what's going to be the future progress based on the trends that we have seen in the past. And they've generally held true uh, uh, based on the past data. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go to the next question, which is, can we get an official announcement of the timeline for the $25,000 vehicle? I think we, Elon mentioned it in the opening uh, remarks, but as we, as he mentioned, we're updating our future vehicle lineup to accelerate the launch of our low cost vehicles in a more capex efficient way. Um, that's our mission to get the cheap, the most affordable cars to customers as fast as possible. Um, these new vehicles we built on our existing lines and open capacity. And that's a major shift to utilize all our capacity with marginal capex before we go spend high capex to do this. Yeah, we'll talk about this more on August 8th. Um, yeah. So, uh, but, but I mean, really the, the way to think of Tesla is, is almost, almost entirely in terms of solving autonomy uh, and being able to turn on that autonomy for a gigantic fleet. And I think it, it, it might be the biggest asset value appreciation in history when that day happens, when you can do unsupervised full self-driving. Five million cars. Yeah, oh, a little less. Well, Some of those have been, yeah, yeah. Um, it'll be it'll be seven million cars, you know, in a year or so. Yeah, um, and then ten million, and then you know, it, it, eventually the, it, we're talking about tens of millions of cars. Uh, not eventually; it's like you know, before the end of this. Decade. Yeah, before the end of the decade, it's several tens of millions of cars. I think. Thank you. The next question is: What is the progress of Cy Cybertruck ramp? Uh, I can take that one too. Cybertruck hit 1K a week uh, just a couple of weeks ago. This happened in the first four to five months since we SOP um, late last year. Of course, volume production is what matters. That's what drives costs. And so our costs are dropping. But the ramp still faces like a lot of challenges with so many new technologies, some supplier limitations, et cetera. And we'll continue to ramp this year, just focusing on cost efficiency. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, have any of the legacy automakers contacted Tesla about possibly licensing FSD in the future? We're in conversations with one major automaker regarding licensing FSD. Thank you. Um, the next question is about the Robotaxi unveil. Elon already talked about that, so we'll have to wait till August. Um, the, the following question is about the next generation vehicle. We already talked about that. Uh, so let's go to the semi. What is the timeline for scaling semi? I think uh, sure. Um, 
So we're finalizing the engineering of the semi to enable like a super cost effective high volume production um, with our learnings from our fleet and pilot, you know, our pilot fleet and Pepsi's fleet, um, which we're, you know, expanding this year um, marginally. Um, in parallel, as we showed in the, the shareholders deck, we have started construction on the factory in Reno. Um, our first vehicles are planned for late 2025 with external customers starting in 2026. Okay, a couple more questions. So, um, our favorite, can we make FSD transfer per permanent until FSD is fully delivered with level five autonomy? No. Okay, next question. Um, what is the uh, getting, uh, what is getting the production rep at Lathrop? Where do you see the megabag run rate at the end of the year? Mike? Yeah. Yeah, Lathrop is ramping as planned. Um, we have our second GA line allowing us to increase our exit rate from 20 gigawatt hours per year to, at the start of this year, to 40 gigawatt hours per year by the end of the year. Um, that's, that line's commissioned. Um, there's really nothing limiting the ramp. So it's, it's, you know, g given the longer sales cycles for these large projects, we typically have order visibility 12 to 24 months prior to ship date. So, so we're able to plan um, the build plan several quarters in advance. Um, so this allows us to ramp the factory to align with the business and order growth. Uh, lastly, we'd like to thank our customers globally for their trust and Tesla as a partner for these incredible projects. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go to analyst questions. Uh, the first question comes from Tony Sakanagi from Bernstein. Uh, Tony, please go ahead and unmute. Uh, thank you for taking the question. Um, I, I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on kind of the new vehicles that you uh, talked about today. Are these like tweaks on existing models, uh, given that they're going to be running on uh, the same lines, or are these like new models? And how should we think about them, you know, in the context of like the Model 3 Highland update? What will these models be like relative to that? And given the quick time frame. You know, Model 3 Highland has required a lot of work and a lot of retooling. Maybe you can help put that all in context. Thank you, and I have a follow-up, please. Um, I think we've said all we, we will on that front. Um, so what's your follow-up? Um, uh, it's a more personal one for you, Elon, which is that you're leading many important companies right now. Um, maybe you can just talk about um, where your heart is at in terms of your interests and do you expect to lessen your involvement with Tesla at any point over the next three years? Well, um, Tesla constitutes the majority of my uh, work time, and I work pretty much every day of the week. It's rare for me to take uh, a Sunday afternoon uh, afternoon off. Um, so uh, I'm gonna make sure Tesla is very prosperous. And it is, I think it is prosperous and it will be very much so in the future. Okay, thank you. Let's go to Adam Jonas from Morgan Stanley. Uh, Adam, please go ahead, uh, go ahead and unmute. Okay, great. Uh, hey, Elon. Uh, so you, you and your team on volume expect a 2024 growth rate notably lower than that achieved in 2023. But What's your team's degree of confidence on growth above 0%? Or in other words, does that statement leave room for potentially lower sales year on year? No, I think we'll have higher sales this year than last year. Okay, um, my follow up Elon on uh, future product. If you had nailed execution, assuming that you nail execution on your next gen, cheaper vehicles, you know, more aggressive giga castings, I don't want to say one piece, but getting closer to one piece, structural pack, unbox, 300 mile range, $25,000 price point. Putting aside robo taxi, those features unique to you, how long would it take your best Chinese competitors to copy a cheaper and better vehicle that you could offer a couple of years from now? How long would it take your best Chinese competitors to copy that? Thanks. I mean, I don't know. Uh what our competitors could do, except uh, we've we've done relatively better than they have. With, you know, if you look at the drop in our competitors in China's sales versus our drop in sales, our drop was less than theirs. So we're doing we're doing well. 
Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think, you know, Kathy would said it best, like, really, we should be thought of as an AI robotics company. If, if you value Tesla as, as just like a, an auto company, you would just have the fundamentally, it's, it's just the wrong framework. And it will come to you. If you, if you ask the wrong question, then the right answer is impossible. Um, so, I, I mean, I, if, if somebody doesn't believe Tesla is going to solve autonomy, I, I, I think they should not be an investor in the company. Like that, that is, but we will, and we are. Um, and then you, you, you have a car that goes from 10 hours of use a week, like an hour and a half a day, to probably 50, but it costs the same. I think that's the key thing to remember, right? Especially if you look at FSD supervised, if you didn't believe in autonomy, this should this should give you a preview that this is coming. It's actually getting better day by day. Yeah, if, if, you, if you've not tried the FSD 4.3, and like I said, 12.4 is gonna be significantly better and 12.5 even better than that and we have visibility into those things, then you really don't understand what's going on. It's not possible. Yeah, and, and that's why we can't just look at just as a car company because a car company would just have a car, but here we have more than a car company because the cars can be autonomous. And like I said, it's happening. Yeah, <clears throat> this is all in addition to Tesla. So the overall AI community is just like increasing, like improving rapidly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're putting the actual auto in automobile. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, you know, so sort of, a lot of it, we like, well, sort of like, tell us about future horse carriages you're making. I'm like, well, actually, it doesn't need a horse. That's the whole point. Um, that's that's really the whole point. Okay. Thank you. The next question comes from Alex Potter from Piper Sandler. Um, Alex, please go ahead and unmute. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, so couldn't agree more. The thesis hinges completely on AI, the future of AI, full self-driving, uh, you know, neural net training, all of these things. Um, in that context, Elon, you've spoken about your desire to obtain 25% voting control of the company. And I, I understand completely why that would be. Um, so I'm not necessarily asking about that. I'm asking if you've come up with any mechanism by which you can ensure that you'll obtain that level of voting control, because if not, then the core part of the thesis could potentially be at risk. So any additional commentary you might have on that topic? Well, I think no matter what, Tesla, you know, even if I get kidnapped by aliens tomorrow, <laughs> um, uh, Tesla will solve autonomy, maybe a little slower, but it would solve autonomy for vehicles at least. I don't know if it would win on with respect to Optimus or with respect to future products, um, but it would. But there's enough momentum for Tesla to solve autonomy, even if I disappeared for, for vehicles. Um, now there's, there's okay. a whole range, a whole range of things we can do in the future beyond that. Um, I'd be more reticent with respect to Optimus. You know, if we have a super sentient humanoid robot that can follow you indoors and you, that you can't escape, you know, we're talking Terminator level risk, then um, yeah, I'd be uncomfortable with, you know, if, if there's not some meaningful level of influence over how that is deployed. Um, and, um, you know, if, if there's you know, shareholders have an opportunity to ratify or re-ratify the, the the sort of competition, I guess I can't say that. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever, that is a fact. They have an opportunity. Okay. Um, um, Very good. And uh, yeah, we'll see if 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 the company generates a lot of positive cash flow, we could obviously buy back shares. All right, that's that's actually all very helpful context. Thank you. Um, maybe one final question, then I'll pass it on. Um, OPEX reductions, uh, thank you for quantifying the impact there. Um, I'd be interested also in potentially more qualitative discussion of what the implications are for these headcount reductions. What are the 
types of activities that you're presumably sacrificing um, as a result of parting ways with with these folks. Thanks very much. So, you know, uh, like we said, we've done these headcount reductions across the board. And, you know, as companies grow over time, you you know, there are certain redundancies, there's some duplication of efforts which happens in certain areas. So you need to go back and look at where 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 all these pockets are, get rid of it. So we're basically going through that exercise wherein we're like, hey, how do we how do we set this company right for the next phase of growth? And the way to think about it is, you know, any tree which grows, it needs pruning. This is the pruning exercise which we went through. And at the end of it, we'll be much stronger and much more resilient to deal with the future because the future is really bright. Like I said in my opening remarks, we just have to get through this period and get there. Yeah, we're, we're not um, giving up anything uh, that it's significant that I'm aware of. So um, we've, we've, just, we've had a long, long period of prosperity from 2019 to now. And, um, you know, so if a company sort of organizationally is 5% wrong per year, you know, that accumulates to 25, 30% um, of, of inefficiency. We've made some corrections along the way, but but it is it is time to reorganize the company for the next phase of growth. Um, and you really need to reorganize it, just like a, you know, um, a human when we start off with one cell and become a zygote and, uh, you know, blastocyst and or you start growing arms and legs and briefly you have a tail. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, so. But you shed the tail. You shed the tail, hopefully. Um, and then your baby and you, you know, you, you basically, you, you, you have to be different. You're, the organism, a, a company is kind of like, you know, a creature growing. And it, it, if you don't reorganize it for different phases of growth, um, it, it will fail. Um, you can't have the same organizational structure if you're, you know, 10 cells versus 100 versus a million versus a billion versus a trillion. You know, where humans are like around 35 trillion cells. Um, it doesn't feel like it feels like, you know, feel like one person, but, um, but you know, you're, you're basically a walking cell colony of roughly 35 trillion, depending on your body mass. Um, and about three times that number in bacteria. So anyway, you, you've, you've got to reorganize um, the, 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 the company for a new phase of growth or it will fail to achieve that growth. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Mark Delaney from Goldman Sachs. Uh, Mark, please go ahead and unmute. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Thanks very much for taking the question. Uh, the company had previously characterized potential FSD licensing discussions as in the early phase, and some OEMs had not really been believing in it. Uh, can you elaborate on how much the licensing business opportunity you mentioned today has progressed? And is there anything Tesla needs to achieve with the technology in terms of product milestones in order to be successful at reaching a licensing agreement in your view? Well, I think we just need to, it just needs to be obvious that our approach is the right approach. And I think it is, I think we're now with 12.3, um, if you just have the car drive you around, it is obvious that our solution with a relatively low cost inference computer and standard cameras uh, can uh, achieve self-driving. Uh, no LIDARs, no radars, no ultrasonics, nothing. Just no, no heavy integration work for vehicle manufacturers. Yeah, it's uh, so it would really just be a case of um, you know, uh, uh, having them use the same cameras and inference computer and licensing our software. And um, but but it's, it's it's once it becomes obvious that if you don't have this in a car, nobody wants your car. Yeah, it, it's like it's a smart car. It, and, you know, I, I mean, I still remember like back when Nokia was. Uh, King of the Hill, yeah, cell phone yeah, crushing, and um, and 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 I saw them come out with a smartphone that was basically a brick um, with limited functionality, um, and then uh, you know the iPhone and Android, but, but people still did not understand that all the phones are going to be that way. There's not going to be any flip phones. 
if there'll be a niche product. Or home phones. Yeah, not even exactly. When was the last time you saw a home phone? Is no it idea. like a I have no idea. Yeah. In a hotel. Sometimes in a hotel. Yeah, the hotels have them. Yeah. Um, so the people don't understand all cars will need to be smart cars. Or, they, or, or you will not sell this, the car will not, nobody will buy it. Um, once that becomes obvious, I think licensing becomes not uh, optional. Becomes a method of survival? Yeah, so it's license it or nobody will buy your car. I mean, one other thing which I'll add is in the conversations which we've had with some of these OEMs, I just want to also point out that they take a lot of time in their product life cycle. Yeah. They're talking about years before they will, you know, put it in their product. They might we might have a licensing deal earlier than that, but it takes a while. So yeah. this is where the big difference between us and them is. Right? Yeah, I mean really a deal signed now would result in it being in a car in probably three years. Mm-hmm. That would like be that. early. <laughs> yeah, that's like lightning, yeah. basically. So that's being an eager OEM. Yeah. So I mean I I wouldn't be surprised if we do sign a deal. I think we good chance we do sign a deal this year. Um maybe more than one. Um but yeah, it would, it would be probably three years before it's integrated with a car, even though all you need is cameras and our inference computer. So it's like not a massive design change. Yeah, and again, just to clarify, it's not the work which we have to do, it's the work which they have to do, which yeah. will take the time. Right, Mark, very helpful. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, very helpful, thank you. My follow-up was to better understand Tesla's approach to pricing going forward. Previously, the company had said that the price reductions were driving incremental demand with how affordable the cars have become, especially for vehicles that have access to IRA credits and some of the leasing offers that Tesla has in place. Do you still see meaningful incremental price reductions as making sense from here for the existing products? And can the company uh, uh, meaningfully lower prices from here and also stay free cash flow positive on an annual basis with the current product set? Thanks. Yeah, I, I think we, we can be free cash flow positive meaningfully. Um, I think Vibe said it in its opening remarks, like our cost down efforts, we basically were offsetting the price cut. That's what I was going to say. Goal. Like we're trying to give it back to the customers. Um, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, like for any given company, if you sell a great product at a great price, the sale, if you have a great product at a great price, the sales will be excellent. Mm-hmm. That's true of any arena. Um, so now, over time, we do need to keep making sure that we're, that the, that it's, a great product at a great price, and moreover, that that price is accessible to people. So it's not you have to solve both the value for money and the fundamental affordability question. The fundamental affordability question is sometimes overlooked. Um, if if somebody's earning hundred several hundred thousand dollars a year, they they don't think of a car from a fundamental affordability standpoint. But for the vast majority of people, are living paycheck to paycheck. So it actually makes difference if the if the cost per month for lease or financing is ten dollars one way or the other, so uh, it is important to keep improving the affordability and to and to keep it's just sort of like making the price more the, accessible. Yeah, the, the, exactly, make the price more accessible, the value for money better, and to keep keep improving that over time. But also to make kick ass cars that people want to buy. Yeah, it's yeah. got to be a great product at a great price, and and the 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 standards for what constitutes a great product at a great price um, keep in, keep increasing. So there's like you you can't just be static. You have to keep saying keep making the car better, improving the price, but improving the cost of production, and uh, that's what we're doing. Yeah, and in fact, like I said in my opening remarks, also like the revised the updated Model Three is a fantastic car. I don't think people fully even understand the amount of engineering effort which has gone and Lars and team have actually put out videos explaining how much the car is different when it looks and feels different. Not only it looks and feels different, we've added so much value to it, but you can lease it for like as low as $2.99 a month. Yeah. Without gas. Yeah.
All right, the next question comes from George from Canaccord. Uh, George, uh, please uh, go and unmute. Hi, uh, thank you uh, for taking my question. Uh, first, could you please help us understand maybe some of the timing of launching FSD in uh, additional geographies, including uh, maybe clarifying your recent comment uh, about China? Thank you. You mean like new markets? Yeah, we, we are. There are a bunch of markets where we don't currently sell cars um, that uh, we should be selling cars in. Um, we'll see some acceleration of that. Uh, and FSD in new markets? Okay. Yeah. So, so the thing about the 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 old the end-to-end -end neural net based uh, autonomy is that just like a human, it actually works pretty well without modification in almost any market. So we plan on, um, with the approval of the regulators, uh, releasing it as uh, a supervised autonomy system uh, in any market that, that where we can get regulatory approval for that, which we think includes China. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, you know, just like a human, you can go rent a car in, in a foreign country and you can drive pretty well Obviously, if you're uh, if you live in that country, you'll drive better, and so we you know we'll make the car drive better um, in in these other countries with country specific training. But it can drive quite well almost everywhere. Yeah, the, the basics of driving are basically the same everywhere. Like you know, a car is a car, train is a traffic light, road is a road. It's like, yeah, it understands that it shouldn't hit things no matter where, <laughs> where it is. Exactly. There are some road rules you know, uh, that you need to follow. You know, in China, it's you shouldn't cross over a solid line to do a lane change. Um, US is a recommendation, I think. <laughs> uh, China, it, it, yeah, you get fined heavily if you do that. You have to like, do some adaptions, but it's mostly uh, smaller adaptions, not like an entire change of stack or something like that. Yeah. Hey, George, do you have a follow-up? Yep, uh, so my follow-up has to do uh, with the first quarter deliveries, and I'm curious as to whether or not you feel that supply constraints that you mentioned throughout the release impacted the results and maybe can can you help us quantify that and is that why you have some confidence in unit growth in 2024 yeah i think we uh, did cover this a little bit in the opening remarks too you know q1 had a lot of different things which were happening you know seasonality was a big one continued impression uh, you know uh, pressure from the macroeconomic environment. We had attacks at our factory. We had Red Sea attacks. We were ramping Model 3. We were ramping Model uh, Cybertruck. All these things are happening. I mean, it almost feels like a culmination of all those activities in a constrained period. And that gives us that confidence that, hey, we don't expect these things to recur. Yeah, we think Q2 will be a lot better. Um, it's just one thing after another. Yeah. Our yeah, yeah, are yeah. crazy. Like, yeah, exactly. It's just you know, if you've got cars that are sitting on ships, they obviously cannot be delivered to people. Um, and if you've got the you know excess demand for one for you know Model Three or Model Y in one market, but you don't have it there, it's like it's it's a quite a logistic. It's a it's an extremely complex logistics situation. Um, so. You know, and I'd say also the we 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 did overcomplicate the sales process, which we've just in the past a week or so have um, greatly simplified. So the it it just, it just it became far too complex to buy a Tesla, whereas it should just be you can buy the car in under a minute. Um, so we're we're getting back to the you can buy a Tesla in under a minute interface. Um, from what was um, quite complex. Okay, thank you. Let's go to Colin Rush from Oppenheimer. Uh, Colin, uh, go ahead and unmute, please. Thanks so much, guys. You know, it, it, given you know the pursuit of Tesla really as a leader in AI for the physical world, uh, and your comments around distributed inference, can you talk about what that approach is is unlocking beyond what's happening in the vehicle right now? Yeah, I think I mentioned like the car, even when it's a full robot taxi, you know, it's probably going to be used around 50 hours a week. That's, that's my guess, like a third of the hours of the week. Yeah, 
it could be more or less but then there's certainly going to be some hours left for charging and cleaning and maintenance in that uh, world it can do a lot of other workloads even right now we are seeing for example these LLM companies have this like batch workloads where they send a bunch of documents and those are run through pretty large neural networks um, and take a lot of um, you know uh, compute to chunk through those workloads uh, and not, now that we have already paid for this compute in these cars, it might be wise to use them and not let them be idle, be like buying a lot of expensive machinery and letting them be idle. Like we don't yeah. want that. We want to use the compute as much as possible and close to like basically 100% of the time, make effective yeah. use of it. That's why I, th I think it's analogous to um, Amazon Web Services, where you know people didn't expect that AWS would be the most valuable part of Amazon when it started out as a bookstore. So that was on nobody's radar, um, but they they found that they had excess compute because the compute needs um, would would spike um, to extreme levels for brief periods of the year, and then they had idle compute for the rest of the year. So then, what should they do with all that excess compute for the rest of the year? That's monetize kind of it. Huh? monetize it. Yeah, monetize it. So it seems like kind of a no-brainer to say, okay, if we've got millions and then tens of millions of vehicles out there. Um, where the computers are idle most of the time, that we might as well have them do something useful. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and then, I mean, the, if you get like to the 100 million vehicle level, which I think we will at some point get to, then, and you've got a kilowatt of usable compute, and maybe you're on hardware six or seven by that time, um, then you, you really, I think you could have on the order of 100 gigawatts of usable compute, which which might be more than anyone, more than any company, probably more than any company. Yeah, probably because it takes a lot of intelligence to drive the car anyway, and when when it's not driving the car, you just put this intelligence to other uses, to yeah. solving the scientific problems, just like a human, or answering dumb questions Ideally. for someone else. We've already learned a lot of deploying workloads to these compute nodes. Yeah. yeah. And unlike laptops and our cell phones, it is totally under testers control. So it's easier to uh, distribute the workload across different nodes as opposed to you know asking users for permission on their own cell phones would be very tedious. Well, you, you just drain the battery on the Yeah, phone. exactly. The battery is also limited. Um, so that, like technically, I suppose like Apple would have the most amount of distributed compute, but but you can't use it because it, you can't get the, you, you can't just run the phone at full power and, and drain the battery. Yep. Um, so the, whereas for the car, uh, even if you're a kilowatt level inference computer, which is crazy power compared to a phone, um, you know, if you've got a 50 or 60 kilowatt hour pack, that's it's still not a big deal to run. So run. If you're plugged in, whether, whether you're plugged in or not, yeah. you could be plugged in or not plugged in, you know, you, you could run for 10 hours and use 10 kilowatt hours of your kilowatt of compute. Forever? Yeah. We're going to have a built-in liquid cold thermal management. Yeah, it's exactly what for data centers. So it's already there in the car. Exactly. So yeah. it's distributed power generation. It's just, just, just distributed access to power and distributed cooling. Um, and it's already paid for. Yeah, I mean, that, that <clears throat> distributed power and cooling, people underestimate that costs yeah, a lot of money. Really big yeah, it does. Yeah, and the capex is shared by the entire world. Yes, sort of. Everyone owns a small yeah. chunk, and they get a small profit out of it. Maybe. Yeah. Thanks so much, guys. And just my follow-up is a little bit more mundane. Um, looking at the the forty six eighty ramp, can you talk about how close you are to target yields and when you might start to accelerate um, incremental capacity expansions on uh, on that uh, on that technology? You know, I, I, we we're making good progress on that. Uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't think it's super important for at least the near term. Um, as, as as Laura said, we we think it will be, you know, exceed the competitiveness of suppliers by the end of this year, and then we will continue to improve it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important to note also that like the ramp right now is relevant to the Cybertruck ramp. Yeah, and so like. We're not going to just randomly build 4680s unless we have a place to put them. Um, and so we're going to, you know, make sure we're prudent about that. But we also have a lot of investments with all our self suppliers and vendors. They're great partners and they, you know, have done great development work with us. And 
a lot of the advancements in technology and chemistry we found in 4680, they're also putting into their cells. Yeah, I mean, a big part of the 4680, it tells us doing internal cells was a hedge against how, how what would happen with our suppliers. Because for a while there, it was very difficult uh, because every big car maker put in massive battery orders. And so the prices, the price per kilowatt hour of, of, battery, of lithium ion batteries went to crazy numbers, to crazy levels. Bonkers. Yeah, just bonkers. So like, okay, we've got to have some hedge here to deal with, um, you know, cost per kilowatt hours numbers that were double what we anticipated. Um, if we have an internal cell production, then we have that um, hedge against uh, d demand shocks, you know, with too much demand. Um, that's, that's really the way to think about it. So it's not like we want to take on a whole bunch of problems that just for the hell of it. Um, it we, we, we did this health program in order to address the, the, the crazy increase in cost per kilowatt hour from our suppliers due to gigantic orders placed by every car maker on earth. So. Okay, thank you. And the last question comes from Ben Kalo from Baird. Uh, ben, uh, go ahead and unmute. And you're still muted. Well, I, I once again would just like to strongly recommend that anyone who is, I guess, thinking about the Tesla stock should really drive FSD 12.3. You really, you, you, you can't, it's impossible to understand the company if you do not do this. All right, so uh, since Ben is not unmuting, let's try um, Shreyas Patel from Wealth Research. Final question. Oh, hey, uh, thanks so much. Uh, just, um, you know, Elon, on, on, during the investor day last year, you mentioned that auto cogs per unit for the next gen vehicle uh, would decline by 50% versus the current three and Y. I think that was implying something around $20,000 of, of cogs. About a third of that was coming from the unbox manufacturing process. But I'm curious if, if you see an opportunity uh, that the other, some of the other, some of the other uh, drivers around powertrain cost reduction or material cost savings, would those be largely transferable to some of the new products that you're that you're now talking about uh, about introducing? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, in short, yes. I mean, like you know, the unbox manufacturing method is certainly great and revolutionary, but it, with it comes some risk because you know it's new production lines, not. But all the subsystems we developed, whether it was powertrains, uh, bat, you know, drive units, uh, battery improvements in manufacturing and automation, uh, thermal systems, seating, the integration of interior components and reduction of LV controllers, all that's transferable and that's what we're doing. You know, trying to get it in their products as fast as possible. Um, and so, so I, yeah, I, that engineering work, we're not trying to just throw it away and, and put it, you know, in, in a coffin. We're gonna take it and, and, and utilize it and utilize it to the best advantage of, of the cars we make and the future cars we make. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then just on on that topic of 4680 cells, um, I, I know you, you know you mentioned it. You really thought of it more as like a hedge against um, against uh, you know rising battery costs from other OEMs. But uh, it seems you know even today, uh, you know it, it, it seems like you would have a cost advantage against some of those other automakers. And I'm wondering, you know, given the uh, rationalizing of your vehicle manufacturing plans that that you're talking about now. If there's an opportunity to maybe, uh, you know, convert the 4680 cells and, and, and maybe sell those to other automakers um, and really generate an additional revenue stream. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about that. Right. What seems to be happening is that the, unless I'm missing something, the orders for batteries from other automakers have declined dramatically. Uh, so we're, we're seeing um, much more competitive uh, prices for sales from our suppliers uh, dramatically more competitive than in the past. Um, it is clear that um, a lot of our suppliers have excess capacity. 
Yeah. <clears throat> in addition to what Elon said, this is kind of by the way, in addition to what Elon said about 4680s, what 4680 did for us from a supply chain perspective was help us understand the supply chain that's upstream of our cell suppliers. So a lot of the deals that we had struck for 4680, uh, we can also supply those materials to our partners, help, help reducing the overall cost back to Tesla. So we're, we're basically inserting ourselves in the upstream supply chain uh, by doing that. So that's also been beneficial in, in reducing the overall pricing in addition to the excess capacity that these suppliers have. Yeah, now, I mean, this is going to wax and wane, obviously. So, um, you know, there's, there's going to be a boom and bust in, in, in battery cell production, you know, where production exceeds supply and then supply exceeds production and back and forth, kind of like, I don't know, DRAM or something. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so it's like what, what is true today will not be true in the, in the future. Um, there's going to be somewhat of a boom and bust cycle here. Um, and then there are additional complications by, you know, with government incentives, um, like the, the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, um, which I always found like a funny name for a comical name. Yeah, is it like the Irish Republican Army? <laughs> the Internet Research Agency from Russia? Independent Retirement Group? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Roth IRA? That's <laughs> like four Spider-Man situations, um, which, I, which IRA wins. Um, so, but it does, it does uh, complicate the incentive structure. Um, so that there's, there, there is perhaps... Uh, there's the stronger demand for cells that are produced in the U.S. than outside the U.S. Um, but then how long does that the IRA last? I don't know. Which is why it's important that we have both in cells and lender cells to hedge against all of this. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. That's all the time we have today. Uh, but at the same time, I would like to make um, a short announcement. And... Uh, I wanted to let the investment community know that about a month ago, I met up with Elon and Vibov and announced that I'll be moving on from the world of investor relations. I'll be hanging around for another couple of months or so, so feel free to reach out anytime. But after this seven year sprint, uh, I'm going to be taking a break and spending some good quality time with my family. And I wanted to say that these seven years have been the greatest privilege of my professional life. I'll never forget the memories from I started literally at the beginning of production hell and just watching the company from the inside to see what it's become today. And I'm especially super thankful to the people in this room and dozens of people outside of this room that I've worked for over the years. I think the, the team strength and teamwork at Tesla is unlike anything else I've seen in my career. Elon, thank you very much for this opportunity um, that I got back in 2017. Thank you for seeking investor feedback and regularly and debating it with me. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, the, the reason I, I reached out to you was because I thought your analysis of Tesla was the best that I'd seen. Thank you. So, um, yeah, thank you for uh, helping Tesla get to where it is today over seven years. It's been a pleasure working with you. Thank you so much. And, um, yeah, thank you for all the thousands of shareholders that we've met over the, the years and walked around factories and uh, loved all the interactions, even with the, even the tough ones. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the call in the next three months, but I'll be on the, the other side uh, listening in. Thank you very much.